Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana innaka antal jawad al-kirim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back to our series Reflections on the Quran We're discussing the methodology of tafsir and we were talking in the previous episode about the commentaries of the Sahaba about the Qur'an. And that when they're talking about a matter of the unseen, even if they don't attribute it explicitly to the Prophet ﷺ, their statement is considered to have originated with the Prophet ﷺ because they would have too much fear of Allah to speak about those kind of issues just based on their own speculation. They would have based it upon knowledge and the only source of that knowledge would be the prophets of Allah. When they talk about linguistic issues, then there are definitely authorities on the language, but there are other authorities on the language also, so their opinion would have to be compared with what else has been expressed on that topic. When it comes to their commentaries of the Qur'an where they were making ijtihad, they were providing their understanding of a verse, then the opinions of the Sahaba carry more weight than other people's opinions. And that's the starting point with regard to their opinions. Sometimes their opinions have not been accepted by the majority of scholars because of some difficulty that it creates in the coherence of a passage and what we were talking about near the end of the last episode was a different issue which has become much more on the agenda in our time, which is an opinion of a Sahabi that may be difficult to reconcile with empirical knowledge. And we're talking about the case of two verses. There's a number of verses that seem to indicate that the earth was created first and then the heavens. And there is a verse that seems to indicate that the heavens were created first and then the earth. And with regard to that, the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, which mentions that Allah created everything in the earth for humans, Thumma uses this conjunction, Thumma stawa ila sama. Then he turned to the heavens. Okay, Thumma is normally translated as then, which indicates chronological order. What's mentioned first came first, and what's mentioned after Thumma came later. So Abdullah bin Abbas, he said that this verse indicates that, yes, the earth was created first, and then Allah created the heavens. And so then he explained the verse in Surah Al-Nazi'at, which mentions Allah creating the heaven, and then saying, وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ دَحَاهَا And the earth, after that, he spread it. So Ibn Abbas said, first Allah created the earth, then he created the heaven, then he spread the earth. And that's a perfectly acceptable way of reconciling the texts linguistically. So it was accepted by the majority of commentators down through history. It has undergone review in the 20th century because it conflicts with the dominant indication of the empirical evidence. Now, of course, nobody was there to witness the creation of the heavens or the earth. However, one of the principles of science is that the simplest explanation is usually the most correct. That's why the Copernican system eventually displaced the Ptolemaic system that was held 
to be scientific fact for well over a thousand years, the idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe and that the planets and the sun revolve around the Earth. In order to make that system coherent, as more and more observations were collected about the movement of the planets in the sky, there were more and more kind of backward circles that had to be imagined in order to make the model of Ptolemy fit the observed facts. So what he was saying is that, okay, there's a planet revolving around the Earth in a circle, and then as it's revolving in a circle, it's also going around in circles around some imaginary axis in the greater circle. So these things are called epicycles. And the Copernican solution didn't require these little smaller circles happening in the midst of this larger circle. And it's an explanatory problem. What's causing these little circles while the planet is moving in this big circle? The Copernican system didn't need those little circles in order to make a working model of the solar system. So, interestingly, the Copernican system was never accepted by the defenders of the Ptolemaic system. Those who were the experts in the field, when Copernicus published his work, they held on to their views until they died. How did that view disappear from being commonly held among educated people was that the people who held on to that old view died out and new people came along who were not committed to that old view. They studied both proposals and Copernicus model made much more sense. What that indicates is that people, once they've gotten fond of a belief, and particularly when that belief system in the field of science, when you're making your living from developing experiments and theories based within that system, you're very unlikely to accept some completely different idea about how things work because all your work will have gone for naught. So there's this built-in kind of resistance to change, not just among religious people, but among scientists as well. Anyway, that's a digression. On an empirical level, it's much easier to explain how the Earth would have come about as part of a larger process of planets developing around the sun. We're all, these planets are revolving around the sun. That's a matter of scientific fact. Nobody can deny that. So to say that, well, first there was the Earth, and then somehow this system built up around it, and now it's part of that system, it's, <laughs> the Sun was created afterwards, but now the Earth has started moving along with the other planets around the Sun, it's far-fetched. So now let's go back to the linguistic evidence that was used as a basis for saying that thumma means chronological ordering of what is mentioned before it and what is mentioned after it. Yes, that's definitely a meaning of thumma, but it's not the only meaning. One of the other meanings is an ordering of ideas, and there is no chronological sense to that. So an example of that, in Surat An-Nisa, Allah is telling the Prophet Yes'aluka ahlul kitabi an tunazzila alayhim kitabam min as -sama. The people of the book are asking you to send down upon them a book, a physical book from the sky. فَقَدْ سَأَلُوا مُوسَىٰ أَكْبَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ They already asked Musa something more than that. فَقَالُوا أَرِنَ اللَّهَ جَهْرَ They demanded of Musa, show us a law right in front of our eyes. فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّائِقَةُ بِظُلْمِهِمْ So the lightning bolt took them because of their their wrongdoing, that this statement was made as a challenge. ثُمَّ اتَّخَذُوا الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ ثُمَّ they took the calf as an object of worship after clear signs had come to them. So now, 
There's a mention of the children of Israel demanding that Musa show them a law and being seized by lightning. And then the word thumma is used, after which it talks about how the children of Israel took this calf as an idol. Some of them did. So from other places in the Quran, it's really clear that first they took the calf, and then later the lightning struck them. I'm going to take a break and be back in Shona. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. So we're discussing the issue of the creation of the heavens and the earth, which happened first, and we're talking about the linguistic indicators of the words upon which the interpretation of Ibn Abbas hinge. So the interpretation of the word thumma to mean chronological ordering of two clauses. The first clause that's before thumma happened earlier and that which is mentioned after thumma happened later. Frequently that's the way thumma is used in the Arabic language but it's not always used that way and it's not used that way always in the Quran. And so we're talking about a counterexample with regard to in Surah An-Nisa where it mentions that Allah seized the children of Israel with a lightning bolt because they demanded from Musa to be shown Allah in front of their eyes. That passage then goes on to use the word thumma and it talks about them taking the calf as an idol the golden calf. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's clear what the order was there. Allah says, And recall when Moses said to his people, Oh my people, you have wronged yourself by your choosing the calf for worship. So repent to your Creator. And then there's an intervening passage, and then it goes on to say, What is Qultum Ya Musa? Lan nu'mina laka hatta narallaha jahratan fa akhadatkum al sa'iqa wa antum tanzurun. So those children of Israel, they said, Oh Moses, we'll not believe in you till we see Allah plainly. So the thunderbolt took you while you looked on. So this thunderbolt was retribution for their taking of the calf. So what all that means is that the word thumma, sometimes it's used to organize a sentence chronologically, two concepts that are mentioned in the same sentence, and sometimes it's used to indicate some kind of conceptual linkage between the two. It's not chronological, and in that case it's frequently translated as moreover rather than then. Now, in the verse about the creation of the earth, where it mentions that Allah created the heaven and later he spread the earth, and the conjunction used there, or the ordering phrase used there is ba'dadadik, which is normally translated as after that. To make the matter more complicated, ba'dadadik also is sometimes used in a non-chronological way. In Surah Al-Qalam, Allah says, The translation, do not yield to any contemptible swearer of oaths, to any backbiter, slander mongerer, or hinderer of good to anyone who is sinful, aggressive, coarse, and on top of all that, baldadalik, ill-bred. So there's no way that you can interpret baldadalik to refer to a chronological ordering. It's translated here by the translators, on top of all that. And Ibn Ashur, the great 20th century Mufassir, the Mufti of Tunisia in his lifetime. I think he was the head of a Zaytuna University also. In his tafsir, he states that 
when overall usage is taken into consideration, Bauda is stronger in imparting a sense of chronological order than Thumma. So the opinion of a Sahabi on an empirical issue is not necessarily always correct. And now we come to the final step in this process of tafsir. We talked about there's an initial kind of linguistic attempt to understand the verse, and that must be subjected to that process of the tafsir of the Qur'an by the Qur'an and also the tafsir of the Qur'an by the Sunnah. If there is some kind of conflict between a linguistic explanation of what a verse means and a well-argued and well-reasoned use of the Qur'an to explain the meaning, then the Qur'an and the Sunnah, those explanations take precedence over a purely linguistic explanation. Because linguistic meanings, there's always a wide range of meaning. So if we throw out the Qur'an and the Sunnah as an arbiter for the intended meaning in a given passage and we just open it to linguistic meanings, then there's 10 or 15 possible explanations, perhaps, for a given word in any particular passage. So that will create chaos in the process of tafsir. So after the linguistic issues, the Qur'an by the Qur'an, Qur'an by the Sunnah, then we look at the statements of the Sahaba, and then we look at Ra'i. It's only after all of those steps that human reasoning, human intellect, that its attempt to understand the Qur'an has admissibility. And this was an issue about which there was great debate in the early years of Islam. There's a famous statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu an. He was asked about the meaning of a certain word in a certain verse and وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ muqita, The normal meaning of muqit related to Qut, which is food, so conceivably, linguistically, muqit could mean one who provides sustenance, but it clearly doesn't mean that in the context of that particular verse. So Abu Bakr was reluctant to give an explanation of what muqit meant in that verse, and he said, what heaven will shade me and what earth will give me shelter if I say about the Book of Allah what I don't know. And there's also some hadiths that are collected by the Ashab sunan and the isnads of these hadiths are not top flight isnads. In one of them there's a person, his classification is saduqun yahim, means that he's basically truthful, but he makes errors. In another there's a weak narrator. The gist of these hadiths is prohibiting people from speaking about the Qur'an based upon their opinion. So if those hadiths are authentic, then does it mean that no opinion is allowed with regard to speaking about the Qur'an? What the majority opinion has come to rest upon is that tafsir that's based upon opinion is blameworthy and those hadiths would be interpreted in light of failure to follow the procedure that has been talked about in earlier episodes of referring the Qur'an to the Qur'an, referring it to the Sunnah, referring it to the learned opinions of the Sahaba, referring it to the Arabic language. So if somebody just starts giving his opinion about the Qur'an without having gone through that process, then that's a blameworthy action. Another way in which tafsir based on opinion is blameworthy is that the person, they have some preconceived idea that they want to impose upon the Qur'an. So they look for verses that they can use to support this opinion. And there's other verses that oppose that opinion. So they impose their opinion upon those verses internally being 
convinced that, you know what, the evidence is not in my favor. The Quran isn't really saying what I'm saying it's saying, but still I'm going to continue on explaining it the way I find satisfactory due to whatever motivation is motivating the person. But that attitude of making the Quran fit, distorting its meanings in order to make it become evidence in favor of your point of view, then obviously that's clearly blameworthy. The tafsirs that are based upon ahkam al-Qur'an, identifying the laws which are contained in the Qur'an, there has to be a tremendous amount of ra'i, of legal reasoning, applied to those verses in order to arrive at the rules that are implied or explicitly stated in the verse. When you look at a tafsir like Al-Qurtubi, which focuses on the fiqh aspects of the Qur'an, he will sometimes find 20 different fiqh issues or more to talk about in the commentary on just one verse. So the tafsir of Al-Qurtubi is considered to be a reliable tafsir. And there are other people who did something similar to Qurtubi from other juristic schools. I think we're uh, coming up on the end of our time, so uh, we'll leave it there for this session. We'll continue in a later session, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. اصبح بصوتك اسمعي